Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of Invincible Season 2, Episode 2, titled, In About Six Hours, I Lose My Virginity to a Fish. This show continues to be one of the best superhero adaptations on TV right now, so let's break it down for all the Easter eggs, animation details, and deeper layers of meaning that you might have missed. Okay, we open on graduation day for the class of 2023, that's this year, at Reginald Bell Johnson High School. Bell Johnson himself is back voicing B. N. Winslow, the school's principal, of course, sharing a surname with Carl Winslow, his character from Family Matters. He says, For some of you, it probably seemed like this day would never come. For others, it came far too quickly. Maybe you're even wondering if you're ready for this. For what comes next? You are. Yes, Phil Johnson says this when he looks out at the class. He sees a bright new world with a special place for each and every one of them, but Mark is not sitting among the subjects of that sentence. Again, making us worried about the fate of this character. Like, he might not be part of this bright future. He might be part of a darkest timeline. This episode's early minutes reference to Spider-Man films, the graduation day sequence of 2014's The Amazing Spider-Man 2, where Andrew Garfield, Peter Parker, nearly misses his graduation and Gwen Stacy's valedictorian speech, and of course, 2017's Spider-Man Homecoming, where Tom Holland, Peter Parker, foils a plot at the Washington the monument. Doc Seismic returns from season one when he appeared at Mount Rushmore. He confirms that he is a doctor, not a professor, because he never taught. He rants that this obscene phallus is made from granite stolen from Earth. Isn't that most buildings? You can keep the ones made of wood. So I guess Lincoln's log cabin, totally okay. The Washington Monument was actually damaged and cracked by an earthquake in 2011. So perhaps there was a Doc Seismic from our world that was trying to reclaim it. As Doc Seismic rides this giant phallus down, we are reminded of another Amazon Prime TV superhero series with this kind of image. I am so sorry. Seismic revealed that since falling in a pool of lava, he made friends with these magma knights. These lava creatures first appeared in the comics, the Pact Volume 2, Number 4, and then again, and Invincible number 36. Seismic was a ruler of all of them. Now, magma being in their names makes less sense now that they're above ground, but, you know, presumably that liquid rock is buried beneath their rocky skin, so it's still, like, underneath something. Mark kills the magma knights and smashes through the ground beneath the monument, punching up through the tip to uppercut Seismic and leaves that monument half-submerged in the earth. Bill Johnson says, As the great Abraham Lincoln once said, whatever you are, be a good one. Did he though? Yes, this is a quote often misattributed to Lincoln. There is no record of him ever saying that. But also remember that the immortal actually is Abraham Lincoln, according to the flashback of his life from season one and confirmed by Amazon Prime Video. So someone ask him if he said this. Mark throws his graduation cap too high, just like he did with the garbage bag in season one when he realized he first got his powers. Bell Johnson continues, even though the ceremony is over and everyone threw their caps already. Be bold. Be original. Be Yes, we are back to cutting to the title card in the middle of the sentence. Whereas in season one, the word grew increasingly covered in blood episode by episode, and last episode it looked totally covered by the final minutes. It then switched to all red on black with cracks forming through it, revealing blue. So it looks like each episode this season, it's gonna get increasingly broken. They kick back at Eve's tree house, which has more decorations and personal touches than last season, like Christmas lights and lots of flowers and plants. Eve manipulates pine cones into beer, but Mark does not partake. As someone who's been watching his mom slowly drink herself to death, I'm not surprised he's staying away from anything alcoholic. Will says, Mark won't even take me flying anymore. Boo hiss. Yeah, in the comics, Will was always bugging Mark to take him flying until they even let him try on his invincible costume. At the USSA, United States Space Agency, we return to the Martian and Sequid subplot from season one. It is the USSA here instead of NASA, but the logo is similar. The mission crew debates sending Invincible to Mars to try to clear out all those Sequids. Ben Schwartz voices astronaut Russ Livingston, who is replaced by a shape-shifting Martian. His superior says, One can blame you for being a little, uh... Uh, not yourself, but it's- Yeah, I love that final little towel pull sound effect added in at the end there. Russ says, I swear on my three chambered heart, just please do not stab all three of them. Yes, human hearts have four chambers. Amphibians and most reptiles have hearts with three chambers, so this makes Martians seem more similar to those creatures than to humans. Alien hearts in TV shows being the main thing that can differentiate them from humans is kind of a trope in TV shows, most notably in Doctor Who. Like the Doctor's people, the Time Lords, have two hearts instead of one. Adam Eve helps the Chicago construction crew rebuild an apartment complex that was destroyed by Omni-Man. The forewoman says, How do I know? 
know that's the code. This mom with a little girl sticks up for Eve, who uses her powers to turn the empty lot next door into a beautiful community park. At Mark and Debbie's house, we see more of the emotional aftermath that they've been dealing with. In season one, these two were super close. And Debbie always knew the right things to say to Mark when he was struggling, but now she cannot seem to say anything right. I think his close connection to her might be what let him keep his humanity compared to the Marks in the other worlds. Like she's his constant for this world. And he's gonna need to keep trying to connect to her to keep that part of himself open. Like remember during their fight, Nolan said that Viltrumite DNA is so pure, it meant Mark was almost full Viltrumite. But we saw in flashbacks that Debbie had a strong hand in guiding Mark as he grew up. So it's the classic nature versus nurture debate. But it's just so sad that Mark doesn't wanna go on one of these all-inclusive resort vacations with his mom, because you know what all-inclusive means? It means the alcohol's covered. After Cecil had their house rebuilt, there's been one faulty cabinet that won't stay closed. And here we see it pop back open one last time after Mark leaves, as if to punctuate that everything has been off with them since the events of the season one finale. The new Guardians of the Globe are continuing their training under the leadership of the Immortal, and they look like they have been struggling. In Rex's locker, we see a folded up costume, a burger container, and two different kinds of grenades. Rex finds Duplicate in the locker room showers, mirroring the season one episode when Eve discovered that he was cheating on her with Duplicate. This time, Duplicate is hooking up with the Immortal, so the tables have turned. I love that she went from Rex, the most immature member of the team, to the most mature member of the team. The Immortal is over a thousand years old. So, you know, there's just a bit of an age gap there. Rex got to hook up with three duplicates in his shower scene in season one, but here the immortal gets four of them, which, you know, has just got to drive Rex extra crazy. At his apartment, the Martian posing as the astronaut Russ clearly hasn't been watering the house plant, probably because he lived on a desert planet and he didn't even know he needed to water this thing. He has a whole freezer full of Alfonso's super pizza, which he eats still frozen. He watches a special on TV about Martian man who was exiled from Mars for some unknown reason. When the newscaster talks about the the heroic deeds Martian Man performed, Russ reverts to his true form and smiles like he's proud. This is probably what gives him the idea to try to join up with the Guardians of the Globe later in the episode. As he flies over a burger mart, Mark looks down wistfully at a bunch of teens eating and laughing. Cecil is sending them to Midnight City, which was cursed by the Midnight Magician to be locked in perpetual midnight. We saw this city in the season one premiere when Darkwing captured two criminals and left them magnetically handcuffed to some metal tubes on the top of a building. At the time, he told them that he'd be back for them the next day, but since he was murdered shortly after, and day is kind of hard to come by here, we now see their skeletal corpses here. They're wearing the tattered remains of the same clothes they had on when we last saw them. Nightboy, Darkwing's assistant, has taken up the mantle of Darkwing 2 since the original's death. He's kind of like the Robin to Darkwing's Batman, and since he claims he's hearing voices, he clearly is not doing okay. Invincible says, Come on, man. Darkwing was at my 12th birthday party, so I'm pretty sure he doesn't kill people. This could be a commentary on how the Snyder version of Batman killed people, and it was a really divisive decision. Oh, one-shot energy, huh? I think I'll try it. Whoa! <gasps> so what does one-shot's focus shoe do? So, uh, one shot really is all you need. Begin your transformation with one shot energy today by going to oneshotenergy.com slash new rockstars for 10% off your order. Darkwing 2 pushes Invincible into the Shadowverse, and this is all taken directly from the comics. In the comics, Nightboy took up the mantle after Darkwing died, but cracked under the pressure and killed anyone in the city who was committing even petty crimes. He had the ability to access an alternate dimension that he called the Shadowverse, which touches on our dimension only in places of extreme darkness. Darkwing got imprisoned after Invincible took him in, but Cecil went to him and offered him a pardon if he went to work for him. In the Global Defense Agency, there is a sign that reads Semper Vigilans, which means always vigilant or always ready in Latin. Debbie is surprised to see Donald there because she watched him die. Donald doesn't seem to know why she's surprised and even mutters, I wonder what that was all about. So yes, this is very similar to Coulson in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. not remembering how he was revived after Loki killed him in the 2012 Avengers film. Later on in this episode, Donald presses Cecil on why Debbie was acting the way she was, but Cecil isn't giving anything up. Eve talks to her mom who reveals that they have been having financial troubles. Eve creates a bunch of food for them, but her dad is his usual dickish self. He's been working at Burger Mart ever since the corporate office for the furniture store he worked for for 20 years was destroyed in the Omni-Man battle. He uses that event to justify his bigotry toward all powered people, including Eve. And he even refers to Eve and others as you people. Like, damn, dude. We see Amber volunteering at the soup kitchen that she volunteered at in season one, and she's multitasking, making calls for the Katie Giles comptroller campaign. Mike flies her to Las Vegas for lunch, but he has to cut it short when he's summoned away by Cecil. Now that 
Amber knows the truth about Mark being invincible. She's super understanding about all of it, proving that he probably should have been honest with her from the start. She was only pissed about it all in season one because she didn't know why he kept standing her up. And once she figured out what was going on, she was mad that he lied to her for so long. Cecil tells Mark that the Atlanteans are pissed that his dad killed Aquarius, their king. According to custom, Mark needs to marry the king's widow, Aquaria, to smooth things over. The supervillain group, the Lizard League from season one is back, and this time they hit a bio-research lab outside of Dallas. Their leader, King Lizard, is in prison, but Supreme Lizard rose up to take his place. So the Lizard League is based off of Cobra from G.I. Joe, and if King Lizard was based off of Cobra Commander, Supreme Lizard is clearly based off of Serpenter, who had a power struggle with Cobra Commander and was made in a lab from the DNA of every world conqueror and leader throughout history. Supreme Lizard's costume design looks really similar to Serpentor's with the snake head and the cape. Rexplode punches Supreme Lizard, but it's not the Rex we know who says, Nope, not this bullshit again. I'm not doing another me. That me better not be you, Rudy. In season one, Robot slash Rudy used Rex's DNA to clone him in a younger form and transferred OG to born Rudy's consciousness into that body so that he could be with Monster Girl in a more appealing form to her. Rex was not pleased about this. The new Rex reveals himself to the Shapesmith, who is actually Martian Russ, who wants to enlist with the team. Underwater, Mark meets Queen Aquaria, voiced by Tatiana Maslany, the actress who played She-Hulk in the MCU. She tells him that he's mistaken about why he's there. Why would I need a king? I commanded this kingdom for a decade while Aquarius played dress up with you humans. In season one, when Omni-Man summoned the Guardians of the Globe right before killing them, Aquarius was shown in his underwater home and he was super bored. And when this alert went off when he was needed, he whooped and cheered. So clearly he didn't really enjoy life down there. Now it all makes sense why his wife was the one actually running things. There's this hilarious moment where the queen explains to Mark that they did away with this barbaric custom of forcing someone to marry and replaced it with the new custom of trial by combat. As Mark waits for the creature he's supposed to fight, it totally reminded me of 1981's Clash of the Titans, release the Kraken scene. Release the Kraken. Release the Death Dweller. And then we get this great fake out where Mark thinks he's going to be fighting a cute tiny creature, but it's attached to a much larger monster. This is like a deep sea anglerfish, which uses a rod-like protrusion on its head to lure in prey before eating it. Debbie is back at work trying to sell a house and this mailbox door won't stay shut. Just like her cabinet door at home, she gets totally triggered by this husband who's a total dick. She's not your pet. Debbie heard Nolan refer to her as more of a pet, and she understandably hasn't recovered. This guy even has gray hair around his temples, just like Nolan does. After Mark fights his creature, it lets out a scream that actually hurts Mark. Later, Cecil tells Donald to give the audio to the boys in R&D. So I'm guessing he's gonna turn that sound into a kind of sonic weapon, similar to the weapons used against the soups and the boys in Gen V. He's gotta be ready in case Omni-Man comes back, or if Mark ever goes rogue. Eve's dad threw away all the food she created for him and for her mom, and even threw away the solid gold apple she created so he could sell it instead of working a minimum wage job. During their argument, he reveals that the community park she created collapsed. The headline on the newspaper he shows her reads, Superhero Sinkhold. And we see a photo of the little girl from earlier and her mom who stuck up for Eve, indicating that they were among the ones hurt. Now at Debbie and Mark's, there are these wooden ducks with pink and blue ribbons on the bills. These could be Korean wedding ducks that were given to Debbie and Nolan at their wedding. These are customarily a symbol of love, fidelity, and peace. So I'm assuming Debbie has been getting drunk and taking a trip down memory lane, which is never a good idea, but especially not when you've recently discovered that your husband wants to conquer your planet. Debbie goes for more wine and that faulty cabinet door finally makes her crack. Mark comes home to find her crying on the floor among glass and other debris, and they finally hug, which hopefully means it can start to heal their bond. This shapesmith gives the Guardians of the Globe the most generic superhero backstory with zero personal details. I was born a baby human right here on the planet of Earth. As he talks, his story is intercut with seeds of what happened to the real Russ, who got taken over by Sequids and is still on Mars as the Sequids tried to take it over. Back at Lizard League's headquarters, the Supreme Lizard is giving a rallying speech before he is killed by King Lizard, and I just love how Supreme Lizard's voice is deep and gravelly, just like Serpentor's, who was voiced by Dick Gautier in the G.I. Joe film. You will do as I say, or I shall burn your nation to the ground! We are the Lizard League! And we are unstoppable! And alternatively, King Lizard has a high shrieky voice, like Cobra Commander, who is voiced by Chris Lota. Superb! Now we must press our advantage! 
anyone is going to turn this organization around. It's going to be King Lizard. Just the attention to detail in this homage is so great. We cut to the Pentagon with a sign that says parking in front, which is both hilarious and serves to let us know that we are in a different universe than the one that we are used to, since the sign usually reads parking in rear. Alternate Dimension Mark is being interrogated by Angstrom Levy about how his dad was defeated and he was captured. They're interrupted by what seems like a female Cecil and a female Donald, and Levy exits through a portal, telling them to make him pay for what he did to your world. <laughs> Please subscribe to all three channels of the New York Stars Network. And hey, we're doing a live show this Thursday, November 16th at Brain Dead Studios in Los Angeles. If you're in the LA area, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Come hang out with us. Grab one of these. We're all gonna die shirts. Inspired by Loki at nerdride.shop. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at EA Boss. Follow New Rockstars. Subscribe to New Rockstars for more analysis of everything you love. Thanks for watching. Bye.